Okay, right. Uh, delighted this afternoon to welcome Geoffrey Feld. Uh, I don't think there's many of you out there today who don't know of the name Feld in relation to particularly the Cumberland Hotel in Bournemouth. Uh, I think many of us have spent many happy hours there uh, and in Bournemouth itself, both certainly I have in my single days and married days. Uh, and Cumberland Hotel was renowned without the Jewish community. And I know people that used to book their holidays year on year, a year in advance, so they could get the same room at the same time. It was always a popular venue long, long before the advent of uh, foreign holidays. So I'm going to read to you the CV of uh, Jeffrey, so you really understand where he's coming from and his background, for those of you who are not too sure about it. Jeffrey Feld was born and bred in the East End of London, where his parents owned the Feld's restaurant. In 1949, his parents bought the Cumberland Hotel, and a year later, they all moved to Bournemouth. Geoffrey studied accountancy, and in 1960, age 24, joined the family business. In 1969, the Majestic Hotel in Bournemouth was purchased, and for four years, the family ran the two Jewish hotels. In 1973, the Majestic was sold, and the Spider's Web Hotel on the Watford Bypass was also purchased. Eleven years later, both the Cumberland and the Spider's Web were closed, thereby ending his 47 years in the hotel business. So, Geoffrey, over to you to tell us now all about Jewish hotels in Bournemouth. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming. I don't know what the weather's like in Bushy this afternoon. Here it's been raining all morning, but suddenly, just as I'm beginning to speak, the sun is coming out, so maybe that's a good omen. Anyway, um, how did this all start with my talks? About 15 years on this particular subject, I do other ones as well. Uh, about 15 years ago, uh, our synagogue in Bournemouth, Bournemouth Hebrew Congregation, have always had, like every, like you have, an adult education uh, program. And the chairman at the time said to me, Jeffrey said, you know more about the Jewish hotels in Bournemouth than anybody else. So I said, yeah, I probably do. He said, well, why didn't you do a talk on the history and what it's all about, about the Jewish hotels in Bournemouth? I said, okay, I'll have to research it, but fine, I'll, I'll have a look at it. So I researched it and then I realized that before my parents bought the Cumberland in 1949, I knew very little mm. about the history of Jewish Bournemouth before that date. So I made, did some research, spoke to a lot of local people, other hoteliers, including, for instance, the Marriott's at Green Park, and I put the talk together. And the first talk was to the Bournemouth Hebrew Congregation, as I said, about 15 so years ago. And I didn't leave a, it as it was. Oh, God, you know. it, it was a very good success. And okay. since then, I, I've given this talk on many, many occasions to Rito, Ladies Guild, luncheon clubs, up and down the shul groups like yours, up and down the country. And the last few years it sort of comes and goes. One year I get invitations, the next year nothing happens. But since the uh, pandemic has uh, started since last March, I've been more busy than ever with this talk. In fact, I've been, dis I think this is my 10th talk to various Jewish groups since last March. I think uh, there's a rough calculation. I think I've spoken to. Can you mute yourself, Jesus? Sorry. I think I've spoken with a rough calculation to over 1,000 people in the last 10 months. So uh, keeps me very busy. As my wife's very pleased, it, keep, it keeps me out of out of her way. That's good. Now, normally when I have do these talks uh, to a live audience, I normally ask everybody, all those people that have stayed in Jewish hotels in Bournemouth, please put up your hands. So I'd like to get hands up all those who have ever stayed in a Jewish hotel in Bournemouth all those years ago. Yes, well, it's pretty much the same as always. I'd say a good 75, okay, you put your hands down, that's fine now. A good 75% of people here this afternoon 
have stayed in the Jewish hotel in Bournemouth. And as I said, normally that's usually the case because if that wasn't the case, uh, you wouldn't be in here this afternoon anyway. Now, we'll have some history to start with, which may be a little boring for a little while, but later on, we'll have some fun with the whole thing. I suppose the Jewish hotel business started soon after the First World War. My mother, who died 14 years ago, and many of you may remember, may remember her, Bloomer Fell. She was a great personality. She died at age 99, and she told me when she married my father in 1927, they went for their honeymoon to Blackpool just for one week. But after a couple of days, she told him she didn't like it there very much. So he suggested that maybe they travel down to Bournemouth, but when they inquired about the prices, it was much more than they could afford. And so they decided to stay put for the rest of their honeymoon. My mother told me many years later that she never forgave my father for not going to Bournemouth in those, uh, on their honeymoon, but they had to stay in Blackpool. By the 1920s, the wave of Jewish immigration into Britain during the latter half of the 19th and the early part of the 20th century had put down their roots. And after the traumas of the 1914-18 war, they started to think about holidays with their families. I stress the word families because that was the backbone of the business, a family holiday. Naturally, sun, sea and sand was their first choice to get away from the smog and the grime of the big cities and the smaller provincial communities where they had settled. And so the resort they headed for, and everybody, everybody will be familiar with these names, Margate and Cliftonville, South End and Westcliff, Brighton and Hove, Torquay, Blackpool, Southport and St. Anne's, Llandidno and Colwyn Bay, and of course, the jewel in the crown, Bournemouth. Why Bournemouth then? Because it was smart, sophisticated, picturesque, clean, with a perfect climate and only 100 miles from London, as it is today. Thus, Bournemouth became, for 40 years until the 1960s, the number one choice for Jewish holidaymakers. <clears throat> and as in other resorts, it started with guest houses and small hotels, which eventually in Bournemouth became large hotels. Probably the first real hotel. Jewish hotel it is, was the East Cliff Court, which opened in the 1920s, followed by a number of smaller establishments during the next decade. And around the mid 1930s, several hotels were built, all designed by the same architect in the Art Deco style. The Art Deco style, some of you who may have, who have gone, been to Tel Aviv will remember seeing the Bauhaus style of architecture in Tel Aviv and the Art Deco style is very similar to it, 1930-ish. And those hotels in that style were the Palace Court, the Green Park, the Cumberland, and the Ambassador Hotels. And the latter, the Ambassadors, became a Jewish hotel in the late 1930s, and it survived as such for 70 years. But the golden age of the Jewish hotels was yet to come. And whilst a lot of Bournemouth hotels were requisitioned during the Second World War, Hummel was a uh, requisition by the Canadian Air Force and the US Air Force, they all had their part to play. Remember, it was not, not long before um, the invasion of Normandy was to take place. So Bournemouth was the massing center at that time. Uh, it wasn't until the Marriott family moved to Bournemouth in 1943 from Torquay, where they ran a small hotel, that things started to happen. They quickly established the Green Park as a first-class 60-bedroom hotel under the Beth Din, and was soon followed by Fay Schneider at the Majestic, Morris Gill at the Langham, Nat Lee at the Normandy, and there were a, norm a number of smaller hotels in Boscombe, which is the other part of Bournemouth, as you know. After the Second World War, there were eight major Jewish hotels in Bournemouth, all offering each one over 50 bedrooms, totaling 600 bedrooms, which was at the time a big slice 
of the Bournemouth hotel industry. And they were in alphabetical order. And I put them in alphabetical order so nobody should get good fronts with. The ambassadors, 102 rooms. The Cumberland had 104 bedrooms. East Hiff Court, 60. East Hiff Manor, 50. The Langham had 60. The Green Park, 60 rooms. The Majestic, 90. And the Normandy, 70. And as in the case after the Great War, in 1945, Anglo jury, despite the new knowledge of the Holocaust, decided it was time once again to enjoy themselves. Remember, this was the time before cheap air travel and package holidays. All you had to do was to get in your car, onto a train, and in a few hours, you were at your favorite destination. No passports, no foreign currency, no airstrikes, no pandemic as it is today, where we have to worry about vaccinations and being checked at airports, and to the hotels to which you were entirely familiar, and above all, the Jewish and mostly kosher. My parents were the last to start in the field of the big Jewish, Jewish hoteliers, and they didn't open the Cumberland until Pesach 1949. From the early 1930s, they were with my grandparents, successful restaurateurs in Whitechapel Road, and many of you as you've heard before, would have heard or been to Bell's Restaurant on Whitechapel Road in London's East End. And my father was the first licensee of the Cushers Commission. And my grandfather, believe it or not, actually taught Maury Bloom how to carve salt beef. However, at the end of the war, my parents realized the East End was no longer viable, as many of their customers, mainly the rag trade people, the schmutter merchants, as used to call them in those days, they were moving into the West End, and they were also moving their homes to Northwest London. My mother wanted to open, at that time, a top-class kosher restaurant in the West End. And I think if that had happened, they would have been equally successful in a top-class restaurant in the West End, as they had eventually to be in Bournemouth. In the meantime, my father had gone to New York to visit his brother and had experienced hotels on Long Island. Now, my father's brother, younger brother, called Hyman, he actually emigrated to the United States, to New York, in the 1930s, where he was in the textile business, and he married a Jewish socialite, a lovely lady, whose brother-in-law was the head of 20th Century Fox. So in no time, my uncle was amongst the elite of the aristocracy in New York. And when my father got there, he took my father for a long weekend to a hotel on Long Island, incorporating every modern amenity, including swimming pools and spas, which today we take for granted. Consequently, when my father was offered an opportunity to acquire the Cumberland in partnership with a distant cousin of his, he jumped to the opportunity. Actually, when he came back from New York, he said to my mother, he said, Bloomer, he said, you know what? He said, I think we'll move to New York. So what are you talking about? He said, well, we can open a beautiful kosher restaurant. Or maybe we'll buy a hotel there, a modern hotel, which would be kosher, it would be wonderful. So she said, my father was, although the, their outlooks, their personalities were completely different. My father was very conservative, backroom guy, very low key. My mother was a great outgoing personality, and those of you who remember her, but inside they were different. My father was a bit of a gambler. He liked to be very, experiment new things. He liked, for instance, this was a case where he wanted to go to New York, just like that, and open things. My mother was very conservative. So she said to him, Isaac, you want to go to New York? She said, you go, I'm staying in London. She says, I'm staying here because all my family and my friends are here. She says, you want to go, you go. So you think, what do you think happened? He stayed, of course, in London. Now, what happened was my grandparents, my father's grandparents, my grandfather wasn't very well. So they went down to the, stay at the Ambassador Hotel in Bournemouth for one week. At the weekend, my father, my parents decided to join them for the weekend. They came down on Friday, and on Saturday morning, after 
Shawn in the hotel, they went for a lovely walk along the East Cliff. Actually, my, our flat now is overlooking the East Cliff. Uh, East Cliff, and those of you that know it, I'm actually, if I turn my head to the right, I can actually see the Cumberland along, along the cliff top. We went for a walk like everybody else to see who they could find who was staying in Bournemouth, what the other hotels were like, and so on. And coming towards them was my father's distant cousin, a guy called Joe Lippman. Now, Joe Lippman was a unique personality. He'd come over from the continent before the war. And to be quite honest, his English wasn't very good, he was, but he could hardly read English. But in the cop up there, it was all there. He was a brilliant man and he was a great property developer. When everybody was selling during the war in the West End, Joe was buying. So by the end of the Second World War, Joe was already a multimillionaire. At the end of the Second World War, he bought the Palace Port in Westover Road here and also the Cumberland. So he said to my parents, he said, you know, Bloom and Isaac, he said, I've been meaning to ring you. So they said, why? He said, well, I've got a good idea. He says, listen, what do I know about hotels? I'm a property developer. I know all about property. But just as an example, as an aside, Joe Lippmann invented the sale and lease back. Those of you that know about property will know what that is. He invented it. So he said to my parents, my idea is this. He said, you come into partnership with me at the Cumberland Hotel, turn it into a Jewish hotel, said, you'll run it and I'll be a sleeping partner. So my mother said, okay, Joe, then well, can we see the hotel? So it just so happened, they were right opposite the hotel, the Cumberland. So he took them over and had a good look around. Of course, my mother was very impressed. My father was even more so because it was just like uh, one of the, the hotels he saw in New York on his visit about the three the previous year. And those of you who remember the Cumberland, here's a brochure, and that's a picture of it, you will remember, as it is today. It hasn't changed very much. There it is, very modern, still, it was only then, what, 10 to 12 years old at that time. So they were very interested. So they said they let Joe know, obviously. So when they got back to the hotel, my mother said, you know, Isaac, it's all very well, you being enthusiastic about it, where's the money coming from? I said, Joe's not gonna give it away. She said, I know that. He said, don't worry. He said, we'll get the money together. And sure enough, within a few months, the money was forthcoming, and in uh, they went into partnership, 50-50 partnership with Joe Lippmann, and it was a very good partnership, and they opened in Pesach 1949 with a bang. And it went very, very well for a number of years, and then several years later, Joe unfortunately died. He actually died in the palace court. He was very friendly with my father. He used to play cards with him every week when he was in Bournemouth, and my father, when he died, he arranged a funeral. And some time after that, my parents bought out the Lippmann family share of the Cumberland. And after that, they owned the whole of it. So, um, Bournemouth after that then became second only to the Catskills in New York State in its range and variety of Jewish hotels. And the Cumberland was full when it opened for Pesach in 1949 as was the Green Park in 1943. And all these Jewish hotels looked forward to many prosperous years ahead. Little did they know, as we all know, nothing lasts forever. And there was intense competition, especially amongst those hotels under kosher license, which brings me back to a little story in the weekend that my parents were met Joe Lip. On the Saturday night after dinner, they knew some, they had some friends staying in the Majestic Hotel. So my father, my father said to my mother, said, Boom, let's go over, we'll walk over to the Majestic and we're going to have coffee with our friends. I don't remember the name to be quite honest. And it'll be a nice evening. So mum said, yes, fine. So they walked over from the ambassadors to the Majestic. As you know, it's not very far, five or 10 minutes walk. And when they got into the uh, entrance of the hotel, now, Many of you may remember Faye Schneider. She was a very formidable woman. She, I gotta say, she was a wonderful hotelier, a great personality, and she knew more about the hotel business than many other people knew. But when the, my parents got into the 
the foyer of the Majestic Hotel, Mrs. Schneider was standing there like this. So she said, Mr. and Mrs. Fell. They did know each other, not very well, but they knew each other. So they said, good evening, Mrs. Schneider. She said, why are you here? So my parents said, well, we just come to visit our friends who are waiting to have coffee with us. She said, no, you're not. She said, you've come to spy on my hotel. So my parents denied it. She says, I know you've got a, you're going to be buying a hotel in Bournemouth and you're going to be in competition for me, with me. So my parents said, no, it's nonsense. So with that, so she said, I'm sorry, you're not coming in. So with that, they were very upset. And with that, they turned on their heel and they walked back to uh, the Ambassador Hotel. It just shows you the power of Jewish networking. What do we need to all this Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all this stuff the kids have today? Rubbish. In no time, somebody obviously saw my parents, one of her customers, Mrs. Schneider's clients, saw my parents disappear with Joe Littman into the Cumberland Hotel. They put two and two together and they made four. Of course, they ran back to the Majestic, said, Bloomer and Isaac are buying the Cumberland. So that was it. As it happens, in the end, it was true. But at that stage, it wasn't yet true, but it, we were competition, major competition in the Majestic area. So, as I was saying, there was intense competition, especially amongst those hotels under kosher license. And everyone knew their place in the tariffs pecking order. And for many years, the Green Park charged, wait for it, two and a half guineas a day. Remember, that was for full board, morning coffee, afternoon tea, evening entertainment, late night tea and cakes, and God knows what else you had. Two and a half guineas a day, full board. And each year, the Cumberland was always 10 shillings or 50p below that. With the Ambassador and the Majestic Hotels, 10 shillings less than the Cumberland, and the Langham and the East Fifth Manor, another 10 bob behind that rate. In that way, nobody tried to steal a march on the other hotels, although each hotel tried to be better with food, service, accommodation, and entertainment. Remember, in those years, very few people traveled abroad. And what's more, there was a 50 pound limit on what you could take with you. And credit cards were not yet invented. Can you imagine today's world not having a credit card? What would we do with our credit cards today? I mean, even now during the pandemic, they don't even take cash anymore. You go into some shops or buy food or whatever it is. They say, no, we don't take cash. Only. So in those years, there weren't even any credit cards. Everybody had cash or maybe some people had checks. So, by 1950, the Bournemouth Jewish hotels offered a standard of excellence never before seen outside America. And Israel was still in its infancy then. Consequently, all the cream of Anglo Jewry came to Bournemouth. Captains of industry, prominent rabbis, and Dayanin from all over the world, and top professional people from all walks of life. And they became the greatest place to meet other Jews and also to find a wife. You know, so my mother, she made so many shidduchim, so many shidduchs during all those years. If I'd have had five pounds for every shidduch she made, I could have retired 40 years ago. And let me tell you one other thing. I met my wife at the bar of the, something happened to the screen, I don't know what. Seems to have gone. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, that's it. It's come back here. Okay. I met my wife, Susan, at the bar. She was propping the bar up of the Cumberland Hotel. I must say, she was only drinking orange juice. Actually, she's inside watching TV at the moment. She's heard this talk so many times, she doesn't want to watch it anymore, hear it anymore. So she's inside. I'm not telling you anything which she doesn't know about. But I met her at the introduced her a mutual friend and uh, we got engaged very quickly, and within the year, we were married. So that's history. So the Shidduchim was a very important part of visits to the Jewish hotels in Bournemouth. Now, every summer was packed. Every holiday was sold out. In those days, 
he only had seven day bookings, Sunday to Sunday. So and he wanted to come to the Cumberland any I must say at this point in time, I'm not just speaking about the Cumberland Hotel, I'm speaking about all the Jewish hotels in Europe. They're all very similar in many respects. And we had only seven day bookings, Sunday to Sunday, with the exception in those years, we had an exception for people coming from Scotland, because believe it or not, on Sundays, there weren't any trains down south from Glasgow, our friends in Glasgow, in Edinburgh, in Aberdeen, wherever they couldn't come on a Sunday. So we reserved a few rooms from Monday to Monday, so they could come from Monday to Monday. Can you imagine not having trains coming from Scotland? Today, there'd be a riot. Anyway, that's how it was. Then. My father had a black book, and I'm sure that Maury Guild and also Ruby Marriott had a black book, and I'm sure, sure certainly Mrs. Schneider had a black book. Now, the black book, my father's black book, contained lists of people who he didn't particularly like, were too loud, ate too much, had too many children, and this black book, he used to go to the reception, head receptionist after Pesach every year. And he said, right, he said, this is my black book. And there was, I want a limited number of children. So limited number, he says, in June for the season, of course. For June, he said, you could have 20. For July, you can knock it down to 15. And in August, I don't want more than 10 children in the house. Not he didn't like children, he had grandchildren, obviously. But he didn't want to make the Cumberland a noisy place with children running around all over it. So that was it. Every Christmas and New Year in the Jewish hotels were absolutely fantastic, wonderful, wonderful times. And there was some fantastic cabaret in all the hotels. So if I mention a few of the names to you of the cabarets at the time, you will know who they are. Benny Hill. Bob Bunkhouse, Peter Sellers. Peter Sellers appeared a few couple of times in the Cumberland before he became an international film star. I think he was still with the goons at that stage. Ron Moody, Anne Shelton, beautiful voice. Alma Cogan, the girl with a laugh in her voice, he used to call her. Uh, unfortunately, she died young. Tommy Trinder, Larry Adler, the harmonicist. Stubby Kay, the famous American comedian. Ralph Slater, Hypnotist, Ray Ellington, we have the Ray Ellington Quarter. Now I'll tell you something about Ray Ellington. Um, Ray Ellington had a great band, a great quartet. Ray was a, I, I knew him because one of the things you, I asked my, your host if he would read out my CV in full, which he didn't. One of the things that I do is I used to do, I still do a lot of singing and I used to sing with bands when I was much younger. And in fact, only a few years ago, for my, to celebrate my 80th, I recorded an album of 10 tracks, which was mainly for my grandchildren, so they can remember what their grandfather was all about. But in those years, I did sing with Ray Ellington a couple of times. And I only found out from a great friend of mine a little while ago, who was, who was in the music, music business for many years, Ray Ellington was actually Jewish. As some of you may remember, he was a big, very good looking, black gentleman, black guy, very well built. And what happened was apparently his father, I think, was from the West Indies. His mother was Jewish. And I think after, soon after he was born, they, the father left, the mother got divorced, whatever. And Ray was brought up in the East End of London with his mother and his grandparents. And consequently, he ended up, he could speak perfect Yiddish, believe it or not. Now here you look at him, you think, ah, but here there's a guy could speak perfect Yiddish, and he was a wonderful musician. Freddie Starr, Eddie Calvert, the man with the golden trumpet, Morris Winnick band. Now I'll tell you a story about Morris Winnick. Uh, Morris Winnick ran a very nice band, Jewish band leader, and one year he was appearing at the Green Park for the Christmas New Year holidays. And I think Christmas night, he played Silent Night, you know, the Silent Night. And he played it to the Foxtrot 
so everybody could dance. You know. Anyway, very nice. The following morning, Ruby Mary Marriott gets a call from one of the Dionym, the Beth Din. He said, Good morning, Dion. Can I help you? He said, Yes, you can help me, Ruby. He said, I'm very upset. So Ruby said, Why? He said, I understand, again, Jewish networking. Last night, your band there played a Christmas carol for dancing. So Ruby said, I don't know. He says, I was in the card room playing cards all last night. So, so the Dion said, take it from me. This was the case. He said, now I'm warning you. He said, you don't, you're a Jewish hotel under license to the Beth Din. Your band doesn't play Christmas carols during the Christmas holidays. He said, I don't want to hear it again. Otherwise, you're in danger of losing your license. So Ruby, of course, said, oh, he said, of course, I will stop that happening again. Diane, don't worry. Of course, that was it. He didn't, he, didn't have, he didn't have any more Christmas carols at Christmas time on the dance floor. Uh, there were a number of wonderful comedians, David Kossoff, Bernard Spear, and many others. Some of them I've even forgotten, but we were very... Today, you hardly hear of a Jewish comedian who could sell Jewish, tell Jewish jokes. In those years, we had quite a few. Now, let's have a bit of fun. We'll recall a typical day in the stay of a guest at a Jewish hotel, otherwise known as the Big Fress. Now, wake up, get up in the morning, you run down for breakfast, make sure you're there before nine o'clock for your big breakfast of eggs, eggs, kippers, haddock, all kinds of... Now, I've, got, I've just got to say one thing. We know today, you go to Israel and many other places, especially Israel, their breakfast, those of you, I'm sure many of you have been to Israel, will know that the Israeli breakfast in those hotels are fantastic. There isn't anything that you can't get. But in those years, going back now to when the Jewish hotels were in Bournemouth, it wasn't, it wasn't long after rationing had finished. Remember, the Jewish people had virtually been starved like everybody else during the Second World War, and they were only now recovering their appetite and getting to grips with big meals again. And the practice at that time, in those years, was big. So you had a big breakfast, all kinds of eggs, kippers, smoked haddock, grapefruits, all kinds of fruit, you name it, you could have it. And then when you finished your breakfast, what do you do? You go usually for a stroll on the clifftop. What do you do on the clifftop? You meet your friends, people still, relations staying in other hotels. You discuss and compare notes with your hotel and the other, the other hotels, especially what the food was like. Now, maybe your breakfast was bigger than, bigger than their breakfast, but you'd soon find out. But remember to be back in your hotel by 11.30 because they were serving coffee and biscuits, all free, of course, including the price. And at one o'clock, get to the restaurant pretty early before they open the doors, join the queue for the, for the dining room for lunch. And during the week, we had a milky lunch, dairy luncheon, Monday to Friday. The weekends, of course, it was meat. And then you had a big four-course luncheon. And one of the things that was interesting in those days, today, Dover sole is very expensive. Salmon is comparatively cheap. You go to a restaurant, you soon find out. In those years, salmon was very, very expensive, and Dover sole was relatively cheap because today you have farming of salmon, those days you didn't. And we used to put on the Cumberland. Dover sole was on the menu two or three times a week as one of the main courses. So can you imagine, big 14 ounce Dover sole, grilled or fried, whatever you like to your liking, served as your choice of your main course. So you had a four lovely, beautiful starter, choice of soups, your main courses, different fish, and a beautiful dessert buffet afterwards. And then, there was coffee or tea in the lounge, all included afterwards. What do you do in the afternoon? Either you go for another spazier along the clifftop, another walk, or you play cards. Now, Jewish people love to play cards. We've heard, mentioned it twice already, three times. I think Jewish people are actually, next to the Chinese, 
the biggest gamblers in the world. The Chinese are the biggest. And there were, I mean, every Jewish hotel had its own card room. Whoever heard of a hotel today having a separate card room? In those years, they all had their card rooms because there were so many card players. So they played canasta, gin rummy, paluki, poker for the hard hitting gamblers, of course, and many other games at the time. And then all afternoon, they would play their cards. And then afternoon tea, big afternoon tea, coffee or tea, sandwiches, different smoked salmon sandwiches, everything. Cakes, biscuits, gattos. You were really full by the time you finished your afternoon tea. But at five o'clock, what do you do? Either you go back to the card room and finish your game of cards with your friends, or you go and have a nice schluff, as Jewish people like to do in an afternoon. But remember, ladies and gentlemen, be down to the restaurant when the dining room doors open at seven o'clock to make sure you're in time for dinner. And dinner was a beautiful five course meal, usually meat, a variety of meat in those days. You could have anything you wanted, lamb, chicken, uh, steaks, anything you wanted was there for approval, more approval. And at 8.30, afterwards, after dinner, of course, you went into the lounges, you had your coffee or your tea, and at 8.30, the dancing started, the entertainment for the evening. Now, every hotel in those days, had the I'm not only talking about the large hotels now, of course, the eight, used to call them the big eight, which I mentioned earlier on in my talk. Every large hotel had their resident band, and we had a resident band at the, at the Cumberland for many years, changed for a number of years. Some of you may remember Johnny Franks, who was a great entertainer, and another one, Stanley Loudon, another great entertainer. We had some really good band units. And every hotel, the larger ones, had a gigolo, a dance host. We in the Cumberland, don't know why, we had to have two. And God forbid, the following morning, those ladies on their own hadn't been invited to dance with one of the dancers. They used to come to the reception and bang on the desk and say, why weren't we invited by the gigolo to have a dance last night? They used to complain incessantly. So the dance host makes sure that everybody got a dance. And then at 10 o'clock, in case you were a bit hungry, they were serving afternoon tea and cakes. And of course, on Saturday, after Shabbat, late on midnight, we used to serve Viennas, Savaloys, crisps, cucumbers, lemon tea, and at holiday times, salt beef sandwiches, in case you were hungry. And then of course, on Shabbos, on Shabbat, every, every hotel had their famous Kiddush buffet, which had chopped herring, smoked salmon, egg and onion, different types of fish on it, all types of beautiful kiddish buffet that one expects from today, and alcohol. Now, Pesach and New Year was equally very, very busy. Uh, Pesach, sorry, Pesach and the Christian New Year was, uh, Pesach was equally as busy as Christmas and New Year. It was a nine-day booking for Pesach, and we had cabaret during Cholomoyed as well. Now, when there was no, in the Friday nights, we used to put on Brains Trust because we always had, all the hotels had prominent people stay. There had been, you know, it could be a rabbi staying with you, uh, solicitors, accountants, maybe even judges. And we used to pick them for a panel, for a quiz on Friday night, we used to call the Brains Trust, like you saw on, uh, on television or the radio. And people used to submit their questions before Sh Shabbos and we used to chair a Brains Trust with these eminent people. And it was a very entertaining evening. Um, on Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah was very busy. It was a seven-day booking. And then let's talk about Yom Kippur. I'm afraid Yom Kippur wasn't so busy. It was not bad. It was 50% full, the hotels. But the problem was there wasn't a lot, lot of food going around at that time. But hang on a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Normally, as you know, all hotels have room service. And we had, like the Cumberland, like in all the other hotels, we had a room service. Normally, I would employ 
say two girls on room service who would serve breakfast in the morning or bits and pieces during the day, some of whom wanted some room service. But on Yom Kippur, we had to employ six girls for room service. Now, in the Jewish religion, according to the halacha, as you know, if you're elderly or you've not been well, if you're ill, you can eat. Not too much, just the minimum to keep you going during Yom Kippur, and it's very acceptable. And everybody who wanted that would have to put in uh, an order form before Yom Tov came, before Kol Nidre, in order to make sure they got their food during the, the fast day. But all I can tell you is this. The whole day of Yom Kippur, I had six girls running up and down, busy all from floor to floor, serving every hour of the day, serving food to all these people. They didn't go hungry, I can assure you. And all those people, they weren't all ill and they weren't all very elderly, but they didn't deprive themselves of food. Room service was the busiest day for on Yom Kippur at any other time of the year. Sukkos, Sukkos and Simchus Torah, we had our Chatanim, as a great celebrations during Simchus Torah. Every hotel had their Sukkos, Sukkos, and we had a sliding roof electric roof on our sukkah in the Cumberland. Now, in those days, you could go, if you're staying at any of the Jewish hotels, you could go to any of the other Jewish hotels and you could go and have morning coffee with your friends, afternoon tea, come into the evening for the entertainment, have late, after, late evening tea, and there was no charge. And it was ridiculous people could travel from hotel. Okay, the idea was quite good. People would go from hotel to a sort of, sort of uh, uh, compensation, go from one hotel to the other. But there are a lot of people who weren't staying in the Jewish hotels. Some, especially the younger people, some were staying in non-Jewish hotels. Some were staying in boarding houses in the town here. They knew some people in, in the Jewish hotels. They used to come in and have freebies. So I remember thinking one August afternoon, I was on duty, as they say, and I went through the lounge of the Cumberland Hotel, and what do I see? It was a hot, it was a beautiful summer's day, and I see at four o'clock in the afternoon, there were 12 young people sitting around, pressing the tea, the cakes, the sandwiches, the ghettos, they were having a great time, okay? They were about young people, they were like 19, 21, 22 years old. So I went over, I said, Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, I said, hands up those of you that are actually staying at the common. So two of them put their hands up. I said to the other 10, I said, right, you lot are going to have to pay for your tea. They objected, but they then, in the end, they paid. The following day, I went to my father. I said, dad, I said, this is ridiculous. Where in the world can you go and get something for nothing? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you can in Bournemouth. Because if you're not staying in a Jewish hotel, or even if you are, you can come and go from hotel to hotel and you can chop whatever you want. I said, we need to charge these people who are not staying here like you and everywhere else in the world. He said, well, it's going to be difficult. I can't, we can't do it by ourselves. It could be others. The other hotels are still not doing it. I said, right, I'll call a meeting of all the other hoteliers and we'll fix the problem. So a couple of weeks later, I called a meeting. And all the hoteliers came from the Ruby was there from the Green Park. Okay. So in the end, the Jewish hoteliers agreed that we were charged. And there was murders when we brought it in to start charging our guests for the people they had in. So of course they had to sign for it. So when the waiter or the waitress came over and said, uh, we'd like you to sign for your two guests. Want me to sign? Oh. What, you don't trust me? <laughs> So I said, of course we trust you. Oh so you don't trust me if you want me to sign. Of course, there was a lot of arguments in the end. They got used to it. But like everywhere else, they paid, they signed their bills. It was on their thing. Okay. Heated swimming pools, yes. The Green Park was the first hotel in Bournemouth, not just Jewish, not just Jewish hotel, to have a heated swimming pool. And it was successful. So we followed a year or so after that. And since then, of course, all, the, all hotels on resort have, okay, right. In those years, 
the climate was different to what it is today. Today, mind you, have a look out the weather today. It doesn't be very good this morning. But basically, the what the min the winters we have in the last many years now has been much milder than we had in the 50s, the 60s, which was much colder. I remember Bourbon, even in Bourbon, we had major snowfalls every winter. And so the climate, even in the summer, was very much different. So they have a heated outdoor pool was unheard of. But they put it in and we put it in. And after a time, it became very successful. In those days, when people came to pay there, there was, as I said before, no credit cards. And they paid their bills either by check or by cash. And my late brother-in-law and I, Howard Inver, some of you may remember him, he was American, he died 35 years ago. We used to take turns on a Sunday, which was the major checkout day. I mean, we had a hundred people checking out on Sunday, hundred people checking in. We used to take turns on a Sunday to go into the, our little back office and take the money from our departing guests. We didn't, we didn't trust so much. You know, there was a time before computers, before machines and all that sort of stuff. It was all done by hand in those days. So I remember one Sunday, I was in our back office. All of a sudden, there's a knock on the door. Come in. And Mrs. Levy walks in. Ah, Mrs. Levy, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Feld. She says, I'm leaving you today. I said, I know, I've got the list, I see. It's very, it's a shame you're leaving us today. Well, Mr. Feld, you know, I've enjoyed myself. I had such a wonderful time. I met my friends here. It's been Oh, wonderful. So she said, I'd like to come and pay my bill. So I said, okay, Mr. Levy. I took out the file, took a bill out. I looked at the bill, I said, okay, uh, you owe us 27 pounds, two and sixpence. She says, you know something? I'm not even going, I trust you so much. I'm not even going to check the bill. I said, fine. She said, just give it, tell me, and he told me what it is, and I'll pay it. Good, I said, very good. So with that, she lifts up her skirt and goes under her knickers underneath. I think they called it in those days a knickel. And she took out from under her knickers all those big five pound, white five pound notes. <laughs> and she's busy counting out the 27 pound two and sixpence. And she gives it to me, you count it, you make sure you count it. So it's right. So I had to be standing there counting from her knickers 27 pound. <laughs> I said, thank you very I gave her the change. I said, Mrs. Levy, Mrs. Levy, it's been a great pleasure having you with us. I hope we'll see you again another time. She says, oh, Mr. Feld, I can't fake to come back and pay you another bill again. So I said, please, God, we'll do the same thing next year. So that was Mrs. Levy. Fortunately, it, didn't, it happened occasionally, but not very often. A lot of people paid. Not a lot of people had checking accounts in those days. In those days, we didn't have to advertise very much. We didn't have any emails, no teletext, no faxes, no mail shops. Just one advert in the Jewish Chronicle. That was it. Okay. Now, today, the importance of Jewish hotels in those years in Jewish Anglo-Jewish public life cannot be underestimated. Today, the kids today, children, my grandchildren, not my kids, they were brought, they were brought up in the hotel scene for my grandchildren you know they say you know grandpa what's the big deal they, actually they understand now my grandchildren are quite grown up they understand now what it's all about and they've heard this lecture many times but children today they say what's the big deal so going to Bournemouth to a Jewish hotel so what of course today they go everywhere before they're 21 they've traveled the world they've been to Australia they've been to China they've been to the Far East They've been to the Middle East. They've been all over America, South America, Europe. Well, that's easy. I mean, that's nothing today. And so by the time they're 21, they need a new new map of the world. Otherwise, when they get married, where are they going to go on honeymoon? Anyway, in those days, you know, very few of us went abroad. If we were lucky, we went to Paris, a bit of a flap around the Europe, the cities. And of course, that's why the Jewish hotel scene in Bournemouth was so important family holidays, and today so many people 
I meet, and I've already heard a couple of people today on today's Zoom in, had their honeymoon in Bournemouth, Jewish hotels, they had their bar, son's bar mitzvahs, charity weekends. Even today, I run into so many people say, oh, I remember I met my wife at the hotel. I had our honeymoon. Our silver wedding was there. We celebrated so many different simchas in the Jewish hotels in Bournemouth. It's a real, even today, pleasure to hear that. And the Jewish hotels were great supporters for Jewish causes. As I said, we did charity weekends. People came down, groups came down from London and from farther afield, from Manchester, from Birmingham, all kinds of different communities that had their charity weekends. But not all was sweetness and light. As in all hotels, there were deaths in hotels as well. Many times we had to bring the, somebody died just on the eve of a major holiday and we had to bring down the body, down the back lift, through the kitchen, out through the back door and over to the morgue. And then we had to go in and clean the room quickly before the next visitors came in and they didn't know what had happened, but they were never to know. The first cracks in the solid Jewish hotel business appeared. How am I doing for time? Okay, carry on. We're I enjoying some, it. I, I had some carry breaks, on. so I'm, I'm allowed a bit of leeway. So no, no, you're, you're, it's, you keep going, Jeffrey. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. First cracks in the solid Jewish business appeared in the mid-1960s, and it was the advent of the cheap packaged holidays to Mallorca and Spain, and also to Florida. You remember in those years, Laker Airways used to do packaged holidays to Miami, and then after the Six-Day War in 1967, when Jerusalem was captured and Israel opened up, then everybody was running to Israel. Now, Kanei Nahara, our Jewish people, we like to be the first everywhere. I've got it on here now. Good, I'm pleased you can hear me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our Jewish people, God bless them, they like to be the first everywhere. First in the world to the new tourist resorts opening up. If there's a good restaurant opening up, you can rest assured our Jewish people will be there first, and so on. And that's what it was like. And of course, as soon as Israel opened up, Everybody was running to Israel. Now, many people have gone on Aliyah to Israel. A lot of people have got flats in Israel. We've got a flat in Israel. Unfortunately, we haven't been there for about 18 months now because of the lockdown. But hopefully we'll go sooner or later. And that's what happened. But also, a lot of people have now bought flats in Bournemouth. And in Brighton as well. And so things have changed. So then we had to go out and sell the hotels for the first time. Before it was easy, I said, for one hotel, one, one uh, advert in the JC, it was fine. Then we had to go out and sell. So my father's black book went in the bin. Mind you, he'd been dead a long time already. He died in 1969. 1969, we sold the Majestic. So we bought the Majestic. And in 1973, we sold it. And we bought the Spider, as I mentioned before, we bought the Spider's Web Motel, which I ran for 12 years. Now, many of you, if you're in Bushy, will know the Spider's Web very well. It's not called that anymore, but we used to have a, a very good line oh, no. in Lavoya Luncheons. Excellent. Oh. <laughs> so, right. in those years, we had a well, survey. Can I have you back 10 minutes? Oh. I'm getting interruptions, sorry. Yes. So we used to do golf weeks, very successful. Uh, the Green Park actually was our first to start back in the 1960s, golf weekends, where they had personalities coming down for their golf weekends. But we expanded that much later, uh, when we first of all in the Cumberland in the 1970s, where we did golf weeks. The whole week people used to come. We had about 100 golfers coming down to the Cumberland to stay. Every day we had a different competition. And then when we bought the Majestic in 1969, we expanded it into Majestic as well. So at one stage, during one week, we'd have like 200 golfers staying in two hotels, which we had to organize every day. Because those of you who are golfers will know what that's all about. The scorecards, the handicaps, it was our frivolous machiga. Anyway, it was very profitable. On a fashion note, in those years, 
my father, like I'm sure Ruby Marriott and the other hoteliers, laid down that it's a law that uh, the restaurant manager couldn't let any gentleman into the restaurant without wearing a jacket and a tie. And sometimes we had ties on a rail, which they didn't have a tie, used to lend them a tie. That when that nowadays, you know, you go to a restaurant, top hotel, you can wear anything. You can wear trainers, t-shirts, you can look as if you just come up from the beach and they'll let you in. It doesn't matter. Fine. I don't think it's such a good thing, but that's how it was. That's how it is. So one week I remember after my father died, it was in the 1970s. Uh, there was a young couple who checked into the hotel. He must have been late 20s. She was a two or three years younger than him. Very nice young couple. And the only thing is he had sort of long hair down to his shoulders and long sideboards, as was the style of young men in those days. And if you look at the um, the football games in those years, the 1970s, you see all the footballers had. Nowadays, they've got tattoos all over the place. But in those years, they had long sideboards and long hair. And this guy was the same. My mother, it was after my father died, used to go and have a meal with her every day. We had a family table. And every meal, she used to moan to me. She used to complain. She said, you know something? What's this man doing here in the Cumberland? I said, what do you mean, Mum? I said, well, look, she said, look at him. He's got long hair with sideboards. I said, so what? This is the fashion these days. I don't like it. I said, well, you may not like it, but he obviously likes it. So the next meal was, why is he staying here? I said, what do you mean, why is he staying? Maybe we should go and send him to the Majestic. So I said, you can't, he's staying in the Cumberland. I'm not going to tell him you've got to go and stay in the Majestic. The next meal was, if your father was still alive, this wouldn't happen. I said, mum, do me a favor, leave me alone. Anyway, comes to the weekend and on Shabbos, we used to go to shore to come in the morning and my wife and the kids used to come over for kiddish buffet and lunch and one this saturday they came for lunch and then my mother ordered a lemon tea with some boiling water so our waiter came towards the, the table and unfortunately he tripped over and the, all the pot of boiling water went to fall over my daughter juliet who was about 10 or 11 at the time she had a bare arm went all over her arm and she started to scream in pain and she was stressed. All of a sudden, this young man, who was sitting just a couple of tables away from us, came running over, looked, took her arm, he said, Okay, so it's not too bad. He said, Tell you what, we can put some cream on it, it'll be fine. He said, By the way, I'm a doctor. So he said, It'll be fine. He said, She's a bit of pain starts. said, But I'm here the next two or three days. I'll have a look at her. I'll make sure she's okay. So he said, Then he went back to his table. So my mother said, Oh, she said, what a wonderful young man. I said, Mum, all the week you've been complaining every meal about this young man. And now all of a sudden, I I said such a thing. I said, yes, you did. And she never, would never admit it. So there you are. Let's talk about alcohol. As I said before, Jewish people, or I start to say, Jewish people love to eat. Alcohol drinking is not really the scene. It's all right for the for the goyim, excuse me, but it's uh, it's okay. So the bar in the, every Jewish hotel had a bar in the big Jewish hotels, and uh, it didn't sell very much. I remember we had the spider's web at the Cumberland. The whole of the year we used to take like five thousand pounds of the takings. This was back in the 1970s, 60s, 70s. Uh, 70s. I did one function in the spider's web where we took one night, 2,000 pounds just for the one night. So you can imagine the difference. I remember walking one evening through the Cumberland Hotel bar and the barman, Francisco, had been with us a few years. He was sitting there like this. He was fast asleep. So I woke him up and said, Francisco, why are you asleep? He said, well, to tell the truth, he said, I haven't had any business, I haven't sold one drink tonight. I said, oh, just then, Mr. Goldstein was walking through the bar. I, which I knew him. I said, Mr. Goldstein, come and have a drink. I said, why don't you come inside? Come in, go inside, get your friends, come in and have spend the evening here. And if you like a nice glass of whiskey, a brandy, a cherry brandy with avocado, which was very fashionable those days. 
He said, I said, come in and you'll enjoy yourself at the bar. With me? I'm not a drinker. He said, you'll excuse me, Mr. Feld. I will enjoy my, join my friends. I don't drink. So he scurried off into the other room. Come the Saturday Kiddush buffet, as I told you before, a big buffet. We have a separate table with all kinds of alcohol on it, whiskey, brandy, cherry brandy, you, know, you name it, we had it all there. And as soon as the Bashkir Shoma made the Kiddush, then everybody rushed for the buffet. But don't go too quick because you get a fork in your hand. Be very careful, right? So the, the alcohol table was managed by one of the head waiters behind. And who was at the forefront of the people going to the alcohol? Mr. Goldstein. Mr. Goldstein came to the table and said, the, the head waiter said, yes, Mr. Goldstein, what can I get for you? He said, I'll have a whiskey, please. So the head waiter said, yes, sure. So the Mr. Goldstein said, can you make it a double? So the head waiter said, yes, we'll have a double. So here's Mr. Goldstein, who wouldn't spend a penny in the bar. When it came to a freebie, all of a sudden, he's a drinker, a big drinker. Uh, in 1969, we purchased the Majestic from Mrs. Schneider, and my father died the same year in the August of that year. And so for four years, we ran two Jewish hotels, two rabbis, two shuls, two yontos, and we sold Majestic in 1973, and we bought the Spider's Web. Um, in those years, we could serve non-kosher wine, non-kosher drinks at all the Jewish hotels. After we bought the Majestic, Rabbi Silver, who was the chief um, examiner of the Beth Din of the Kashrus Commission, chief inspector, came to me and said, Jeffrey said, you know, it's time we clamp down on all this non-kosher wine you're serving. He said, in future, we want you, all the Jewish hotels should only serve kosher wine. I said, Rabbi Silver, I'm sorry, we're not going to do that. We're already losing business to Israel, to abroad. I said, now you want to do, get rid of the non-kosher wines? We don't have, have anything to serve. Remember, in those years, today, you can get kosher wines from all over the world. Israel has got fan fantastic uh, wineries. The wines are top class. But besides that, you can buy kosher wines from France, from Italy, from South America, wherever you can buy it. But in those years, all you could get was Paul Wynn from Israel. That was about it. So I said to him, Rabbi Silver, we're not going along with that. So he said, all right. In the end, he agreed. But after we sold the Cumberland, they then instituted that situation. Um, talk a little about gambling. I mentioned before about the cards and the Jewish people are big gamblers. My father was, he wasn't a big gambler, but he loved to be in the card scene. And one of his biggest loves was he and my mother used to love to go to Cannes in the south of France two or three times a year for a couple of weeks. And dad used to love to go to the casino where he'd play in the big table, the Chemin de Fer. He used to keep a book of all his winnings, but he didn't, never used to record his losses in case my mother looked, managed to find the book. So that was that. So he used to have this, he loved to play gin rummy. And as you heard already, from Barry Shooter, he had a he had a gin rummy score of some of which used to run two or three times a week in the hotel from his some of his customers like Barry's father and other friends of his local friends, other some of the other hotel hoteliers, Bob Myers from the Normandy used to come and used to have a regular card score, which used to go on to the early hours of the morning. Well, one morning it went on very, very late. It didn't finish till about five o'clock in the morning. I don't know, Barry, if your father was involved in that game, but maybe he wasn't. Anyway, we, we used to have a house just over the road from the Cumberland, the back of the Cumberland, lovely house. So five o'clock in the morning, my father finished his game of cards and he went back to the house. He went upstairs to the bedroom. My mother was, she was fast asleep and he started to get undressed to go to bed, five o'clock in the morning, just getting light. And started in those years, he used to wear braces, used to take his braces off, just take his trousers down. All of a sudden, my mother woke up, woke up. She said, Isaac, where are you going? So he said, well, Luma, I thought it'd be a good idea. He thought very quickly. I thought it'd be a very good idea. He says, I'm getting dressed. 
because I thought if I go to hotel so early in the morning, I can catch all those Ganevim and find out what they're stealing from us first thing in the morning when we're not there. So she said, Isaac, that's a very good idea. You go, darling, you go over and find them. So the poor guy had to get back up, dress him, put his jacket back on, schlap back to the hotel, spend a few hours there. And later in the morning, he came back exhausted to go to bed. Many years later, she told me, she says, I knew what was going on. She says, I was asleep. I wasn't asleep when he came and I was awake. And I knew where he'd just come back from his car game. But I was determined to teach him a lesson. He should go back fit to the hotel, get back dressed, teach him a lesson. He shouldn't stay out so late in future. That was that. All the hotels continue to lose the share of the market. We were going abroad, although despite all the special efforts we did, children's weeks, we laid on special children's entertainers during the summer for the kids. We used to try and attract as many kids. Once you track the kids, the families come as well. And that's what we used to try and do. We continue to do a share of the market. So unfortunately, in 1984, we sold the Cumberland to a non-Jewish company. My mother, now, talk just one minute about my mother. He was, as I said before, a wonderful personality. They used to call her the hostess with the mostess. My mother, if she didn't know you, she knew most of her clients and she knew their background, their families and everything about them. If she didn't know you, she'd make a point of going up and within five minutes, she knew everything about this person she'd never met before. Their background, their history, their families, and she made sure however long they stayed in the hotel, they were well looked after and they had a wonderful time because that was her nature. She didn't do it because she was interested in the money side of it. She did it because she loved people and she wanted to make them as happy and as comfortable as possible when they stayed under her roof. And that's what my mother was all about, Blumerfeld. And she was devastated when the hotel was sold and then she retired, she was 75 when we sold the hotel. And it was very sad because it was a way of life. And I grew up from 15 years old in that hotel. But as I said earlier on, nothing lasts forever. The Green Park was sold for flat developments, now a big block of flats, as was the East Hill Manor. The Langham is, was the um, changed to a non-Jewish hotel. It's now been taken over by a French group, or hotel, uh, one of the chains of hotels, French chain. That used to be the, that was the Langham. The Majestic, unfortunately, which we sold after four years to a developer, a spot, um, Spider's Web, with the, he had this, he developed Spider's Web and we swapped it for the Majestic. He, he took Majestic and took the Spider's Web. And he got greedy because he tried to get, we had planning permission for 50 flats on that site, which was very good. And he thought he'd get 100 flats. So he went back to the council and back to the ground landlords, and he messed around with it. The time he, he was rejected, tried again, the time he, uh, all that happened, the Yom Kippur broke out. The Yom Kippur War broke out in November 1973, and the, and the property market went like that. He lost all his money, unfortunately. After that, the Majestic was taken over by Shearings, after changing hands a number of times, Shearings to Coach Company, a travel company, and unfortunately, Shearings themselves went bust earlier last year after the lockdown. And at the moment, I'm afraid the Majestic is boarded up and who knows what's going to happen to it. Normandy, the ambassador has changed hands. The ambassador was actually bought out by a large group of hotels called Britannia Hotels. Actually, it's run by the uh, chairman, he's Jewish, and he lives in Manchester. But uh, they run the, that hotel, as they do the Heathlands and also the Royal Bath now. Um, the only hotel that's still up and running as a Jewish hotel is the Normandy, which is non-stop run as a, as a Jewish hotel, except for a short period when it was part of Nadbrokes. And unfortunately, not unfortunately for those people who like uh, ultra-Orthodox hotels, it is a hotel run mainly for the Haredim, the Haredim. And it's still running, but they only open at specific times when there's a simcha 
or a, a special weekend or something like that. We do also have, of course, a Lubavitcher hotel called the Water Gardens run by our, Chaba, our Lubavitch rabbi, Rabbi Yossi Roberts. It's a small hotel, 30 bedrooms. And that's it as far as the hotel scene. The usual question, I'll ask for any questions. I know that I'm over on my time by about quarter of an hour. The usual question, the first question I always get asked is, would you, is there any future in a Jewish hotel in today's world in Bournemouth? And I'd say probably not. Maybe it was a small, uh, super luxury, boutique style hotel, maybe 40, 50 bedroom. There might be a case to run it. Maybe, especially now, after this pandemic, with people not going abroad and are getting used once again to holidaying in Britain, there may be a case for that. But other than that, I can't see it. Ladies and gentlemen, I've overrun my time. I hope you've enjoyed any, everything I've said. Thank you for listening to me. I hope we'll do it again some other time. Thank you. Jeffrey, thank you so much for that. You, you've overrun your time, but it, it's fine. We, we're so interested. You've brought back so many memories to so many of us, I'm sure. Uh, it's been so interesting, not only about the Cumberland, but the whole histories of uh, Jewish hotels in Bournemouth. I mean, uh, I suppose for all of us, uh, there's probably people who would like to ask you some questions, but I, I well remember staying at the Cumberland, and you mentioned the Shabbos Kiddush. I almost remember being killed in the rush for the table, which was a yeah. thing there. You only did that once, and you learned very quickly how to manage that, but uh, such was exactly. the, the need for more food for Jewish people. Absolutely. Right. Um, anybody would like to ask Jeffrey some questions? Jeffrey, you, you're right to hold on for a while? Yes, absolutely. Anybody wants to oh, ask I have to go. Uh, OK, Aaron. if you could just sort of wave at us. Uh, Ronnie will try and pick up your hands waving. Thank you very much. OK, bye. bye. Did you hear of the hotel called the Baraka? Yes, absolutely. I used to go there. I yes. stayed there. I stayed with the Grossmans in Bournemouth in yes. their hotel during the war? Actually, the Baraka, there's a lot of research. I only did a, a, a small research on Jewish hotels before the Second World War, but actually there was a lot. It actually started in the 1900s. Two small Jewish boarding houses start to open already, and the yeah. Baraka was one of the largest ones and was yeah. one of the most popular ones. And what, now, let's be frank, what could be better named for a Jewish hotel than Baraka Hotel? Wonderful. Yeah, okay. I stay there. I All right, Nova, let somebody else come in now. Thank I'm you. Good. Okay. Joe Cooper wants, has got a hand up. Okay. No, it's me. Yeah. Okay, go on, carry on. Ah, who, me, yeah. Hi. Um, in the early 60s, I, would, I belonged to a, a charity called The Four Wheels, who used to be Mogin David Adom. Yeah, and we used to have the much. most amazing weekends at your hotel. Fantastic. Mm. I remember that. <laughs> I remember the four wheels very, very well. They were regulars of ours. Very good. Yeah. Nice young yes. yeah. group of young people. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. good. And I know a lot of people used to arrange their holidays around our weekend because they yeah. were such good fun. Good fun, yeah. And it was lovely memories. Thank you. But I've Thank got you. lovely memories of Blackpool as well because I'm from the north. I can hear that. I can hear you. <laughs> can you can you guess from my accent? Amazing. Absolutely. Listen, I've got, I've got, my son-in-law's from Manchester, so I'm not. Uh, I was used to the uh, north, northwest accent. Yes. Well, after sixty years, I've still got my accent. You still got it. That's yes. me. Thanks, Joe. Anybody this, else? Yeah. Right, Howard. One more, and then I'm going to go. Howard, unmute yourself. It was good, wasn't it? Didn't you enjoy it? I remember on, three things about, um, about Bournemouth. We used to stay at the, uh, the Ambassador. My parents liked the Ambassador. But a lot of youngsters were at the Cumberland. So I remember two things about the Cumberland. One was getting in through one of the side windows. because they oh, You're the one. I've been Thunder. waiting for you to arrive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And the other thing was that Kiddush on Shabbos was a dangerous field because although they made Kiddush, most of the people had already started by the time before Kiddush had finished. You right. never thought that they'd seen food before. <laughs> Amazing. 
it was a very, very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Howard, how, I must tell you that all through the summer periods, during those years, my brother-in-law, my brother-in-law Howard and I used to stand on Saturday nights, we used to stand on the door, throwing the young people out of the Cumberland and try to get in. And I remember distinctly a number of you guys who got in through the back windows. That's right. I, I remember that. And they yes. used to have one of us standing on the back windows to make sure he didn't get in. And I tell you what, if you send no, me a I bill, just want to know one thing. Yes. Do you owe, do you owe me any money? Uh, yeah, it's in, it's in my pants <laughs> now. Right, OK. <laughs> OK, anybody else? Can I ask something, Stuart? Who's that? Anne. Go on, Anne. A facetious question. Were the gigolos Jewish? <laughs> Very good question. No, we no. didn't... We wouldn't employ Jewish <laughs> gigolos, it was too dangerous. Uh, <laughs> they were not Jewish, but they were very popular. One after one, you know, the ambassadors had a coat hanger, didn't they? Well, it looked as if you yeah. did, yeah. I, I remember staying in Bournemouth at a, another hotel. I had friends staying at the Cumberland Hotel with their parents through my single days. And I said, I'd like to come, you know, come visit you in the hotel. They said, you can come along, but don't let Jeffrey Feld see you because he won't let you in. It was, you know, in those days, I suppose, when the youngsters came in and took advantage of it. Absolutely. OK, any other questions before we let Geoffrey go? No? Just let, me, just let me say something. This is definitely, I just want to say thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us. It was... It was It was a great, fascinating talk and brought back so many memories for me. I think I've stayed in a part. I don't think we stayed at the Green Park, but I think I've stayed at every other hotel, yours included. Thank and you. it was at the time when the children, when they had a children's entertainer and we had such fun with our children. It was absolutely great. Thank you so much. Jeffrey, we, we've had one of our biggest audiences today, which shows the interest in people and memories of Bournemouth. And I think you can add about another 230, <laughs> 240 people to the list to of people number. you've spoken to this year. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Uh, just to remind you, we have current affairs on Thursday with Jeffrey Demel. Uh, and next Tuesday, we have Dr. Justin Daniels, who will be talking to us, uh, Daniel. Uh, Justin is a consultant paediatrician, and I'm sure he'll be talking to us about all things medical, including yeah. COVID. So uh, we look forward to that. So look forward to you joining us Thursday and look forward to joining you all, uh, joining us all next Tuesday as well. Take care. Look after yourselves. Thank you very much again, Jeffrey. Thank you. Pleasure. Wonderful Thanks. talk.